Thank you. Thank you for getting back quickly. Um, so funding and a master class. You're probably going to say, you know, we've heard the word master class. Master class for me, I grew up as a dancer and uh, we, we brought in some of the you know, top choreographers and top dancers to do intensives, to do incredible intensives on dance. And so when I designed the show, I thought we need to do some of these master classes. So um, I think it's a great context about uh, what type of information is going to be relayed to you. So this is an incredible brain trust of people on stage. And it's being led by um, Jack Young, who uh, it's seriously, I feel like, is reprising his role from last year's show. <laughs> He's just an, an incredible. Um, he obviously is leading Qualcomm Life's Fund in incredible efforts. But wait till I just tell you, a few of his hobbies made me feel incredibly lazy. Piano, 10 plus hours of practice per week. And his instrument of choice is a Steinway Model O. Tennis, 4.0 to 4.5 club player, three to four times a week, singles mostly. His racket, okay, I can't even pronounce it, Babalat, is that right? Oh, my. Pure drive, light GT. Skiing, 10 plus days per season. Favorite mountains are Aspen, Deer Valley. His equipment, K2s, the other one I can't read. So <laughs> let's bring Jack up, thanks. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you can you hear, hear me here? Um, thanks for the, the generous introduction. Uh, hobbies aside, I do work, and, and in fact, in Qualcomm <laughs> Ventures, we're considered a very hard worker. And last year, we were, we were voted as, as the most prolific uh, investor in digital health. So I'm honored to be back here again. And uh, just to lead off, obviously, you know, the digital health, thanks to all of you, support and interest, it's, it's, it's very, very high. Uh, in terms of investment, probably some of you have seen the press, uh, Rock Health compiled a status that shows a 50% uplift in both the number of deals are funded, about 150 deals, about $1.4 billion went to work. That's also about a 50% uplift from the year before. There's about 180 some organizations, the Ventures Institute, other institutions investing in digital health companies. So we see a good health uh, clip uh, crescendo into this year. So my prediction, personal prediction, is going to be somewhat uh, a $2 billion investment into the digital health. And then hopefully we'll see some uh, interesting exits, which is already happening. So as uh, Jill mentioned last year, I was uh, giving a task to give a, a talk on uh, financing uh, from all stages. So when she and I talked about this year, earlier this year, she said, hey, why don't you come back to do this again? No, 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 no. I go, well, even though last year was fun for me, but in terms of this 360 degree uh, uh, financing all from an from a angel stage all the way to exit, I am only have a, a, actually a view of a very small portion of it in a corporate venture uh, mid to later stage. So instead of for me to repeat that, I thought it wouldn't be great that I can uh, call up my friends and colleagues to uh, have them to share their perspectives. So instead of for me to give another get a monologue. So that was the essence of uh, designing this class. Uh, so with that, I'll uh, kick off with some introductions. And uh, I have a, a, sort of a list of questions prepared for the panelists. We'll lead off that. And hopefully, we have some questions, uh, Q&A time leave uh, for the end of the session. All right? with that, why don't we go with uh, Dom, if you don't mind, go ahead first. So I'm Don Ross, and I'm uh, Managing Director and Founder of Health Tech Capital. Uh, we're located up in the Silicon Valley area. And so we really came into, I don't, so we'll go quickly on this slide, of uh, really looking at the whole spectrum of opportunities in the health tech space, which uh, really goes everywhere from the in-hospital workflows all the way out into chronic disease management and, uh, uh, and working with the consumer. And so what we did when we put together Health Tech Capital, Andy Geist and I founded it about uh, three years ago. Uh, we're longtime uh, early stage investors. We really wanted to bring together a technologies and, and expertise from a multiple areas so that we could really address this space. And so that's where we have people from both the healthcare, IT, uh, user behavior spaces. And with that, we've really put together a whole ecosystem. We felt that we had to really get everyone under one tent. 
Uh, so with that, we have venture capital members. We have a foundation of angel members. Uh, at, at its heart, we are an angel group, and we do do angel investments. Uh, that said, we'll do both uh, internal syndications with our other industry and venture members. We'll also do external syndications with uh, other angel groups. Uh, and so that's also given us a lot of flexibility. We have a tremendous amount of uh, focus on also providing mentoring and help with the companies because in this emerging space of health tech, nobody knows everything. And so being able to bring a breadth of expertise in, really work with the companies to, uh, uh, to plug holes, to uh, open up Rolodexes, to really uh, having understanding of marketing and how to sell to hospitals, uh, bringing all of that in really helps with both the company's success and of course as the company's successful, that helps with our investments. So this is part of just a, a quick explanation of this collaborative ecosystem where we're both providing both funding and mentoring, strategic partnering. Uh, our hospital partners also can provide validations of pain points. And then this is just, a, I'll close on this slide here because I know we'd like to get to the discussion. We also have a, uh, a conference that we do that's quite synergistic to this conference. It'll be coming up in the fall, so this is my brief shameless plug for the uh, our fall conference where we're focused really on the nuts and bolts of building businesses in the health tech space. So thank you very much. Thank you, Don. Well, next up, uh, we have Akilu. Akilu. Thanks, I'm Akilu Sanborn with Oxford Finance, and I don't know where my slides are, but uh, I can talk, I can do a chalk talk too. I, I'm a bit of an outlier here, and if anyone can help, oh, there we go. A bit of an outlier being a biologist and having straight into the moving money around business for the last 13 years, a little less than half of it on the venture equity side, and more than half of it now on the venture debt side. And so I will bring the venture debt perspective, which is also a bit of an outlier in the <coughs> whole capital, um, capital food chain in the sense of it being usually available more for later stage companies, but uh, we've been watching the digital health space for a while. We have a number of investments in the space and we're very eager about it. So I feel like a four-year-old in a candy shop. I don't exactly understand all the candy, but it all looks good. <laughs> and so just a couple slides about what is venture debt since I get asked that a lot. Um, it's a, it's a basically a three to four year old senior secured loan and it, the, if you remember just one thing about it, remember that it's used to build equity value and anywhere where you can use debt, the debt cost to build equity value, it's a winning proposition to the you know, management founders and investors as well as to us because our portfolio credit worthiness went up and the value went up. And the issue comes sometimes in that we need enterprise value to be able to backstop the loan if things don't go well. So there's a question of how much debt can you really put to companies and at what stages. It's available typically to venture backed and public companies. It's rarely available to non-institutionally backed companies and we're gonna be talking about that a little bit. It, venture debt typically follows VCs. It's as a top up of the round, oftentimes a fifth to a third of the round. And what it's not is it's not a bridge loan, it's not a convertible note, and it's not an equity funding. So we're not motivated by upside, we're motivated by making sure we get paid back. And uh, I'll make this my last slide, but I believe that there are handouts and there's a couple, couple of other things there as well. And the key uses of venture debt are to extend runway to inflection points. That's where you build the equity value using debt. To accelerate commercialization and just sort of amp up your sales efforts. Accelerate pipeline programs if you have multiple programs. Finance and licensing and acquisitions. And then buy time during negotiations towards a deal, you know, IPO, M&A, or, or what have you. And uh, from our perspective, we're very excited about the digital health space. Um, we're waiting for companies, for more companies to become venture backed so that we can work with them. A couple of examples that are currently in our portfolio <coughs> include, we used to have body media in our portfolio. I noticed they're a sponsor. Same with Dexcom. We're having active uh, involvement with them right now as well as Sotera Wireless as well as Proteus Digital Health. But again, these are all companies that are a little bit on the later stage. So we're very much watching and waiting and eager to continue in the space. And Last but not least, the reason we like the space is unlike most deals that I see in biotech, where you don't have revenues and you're not even really clear you have products, it's mostly clinical development, you folks are working on real products, real services that will be sold to real customers and creating real revenues and use of debt is very clear in that situation. So thanks and thanks for the invitation to be part of this panel. Thanks, Kilo. Well, it's fascinating the, uh, 
I heard this is probably the best tagline to describe debt financing in my uh, professional career. Debts to build equity value. I like that. So next one up, uh, Roy, um, experienced uh, also a hobbyist uh, pilot to my, uh, to my knowledge. Well, uh, Dr. Sanborn, you call yourself an outlier. I am a total alien to this group. Um, how did I get in, invited here? Um, I have an incubator. Uh, my background semiconductors, uh, founded Peregrine Semiconductor and Silicon Wave, which got sold to Qualcomm. And uh, a few years ago, Admiral Davis and I started an incubator in San Diego that was totally pro bono. So it, unlike the other incubators around the country that are for profit, where they take something from the entrepreneur, this is completely pro bono and, and supported by the community through the tech sector. Um, so what could be more fun than starting one company uh, having 26 companies, actually 27 now. So uh, that's my boss, Mike, out of HP. Uh, and we get right, to, that's my board, my bosses, more bosses. <laughs> um, <laughs> So uh, one slide really tells it all. We started this about three years ago. Uh, we've had over 525, 28 applicants uh, have applied to our incubator, a very rigorous selection process. Uh, we've raised $146 million in venture capital for the companies while they've been in the incubator and graduated. Have, we've had graduations and three acquisitions. Uh, 27 companies incubating now and 600 jobs created in San Diego, which is just fabulous for the community here. Uh, companies, many of these are healthcare IT companies. Uh, we had no idea what kind of companies would apply to enter in the, to the incubator. We've had 12, round, 12 selection rounds uh, to, have, to admit companies. And Admiral Davis and I didn't have a clue of what would be applying. We thought it would be traditional wireless telecom stuff. And amazingly, we got lots of healthcare, IT, and digital health companies. And um, that got us immersed in that area. Um, I won't go over all of them, but many of them are in the healthcare area, including some genomic startups. Um, as you can see, we've got quite a few companies under incubation. One of our most famous companies is a company called Eco ATM that recycles your cell phone in the malls around the country. They came to us as a cardboard box, and we got them incubated and out and funded. Uh, scoring process, how do, you, how do you enter the incubator? Pretty rigorous process, not unlike venture capital, looking at deal flow. Uh, what do they get? Uh, amazing. It, if you enter our incubator, you're the luckiest venture in San Diego because everything is pro bono. You pay us nothing to enter. You pay us nothing while you're there. You pay us nothing when you leave. And uh, free rent, free utilities, free broadband, mentoring, access to capital. Um, just an amazing opportunity. Um, when I started my company, it was a very lonely place. And these guys are lucky. Uh, every month, milestone, how are they doing, measure their milestones, operational reports. So this is come to Jesus time every month. And when they turn all red and we can't fix them, no matter how hard we try, they're asked to leave. It's very Darwinian. Um, Qualcomm, great partner. If companies enter the incubator in areas of interest to Qualcomm in their ecosystem, then the Qualcomm Labs provides up to a quarter million dollars of seed funding for these companies. And uh, we have now, I think, five companies that have been funded by Qualcomm, including uh, one recently uh, through uh, Qualcomm Labs, but it's a, uh, a life science venture with a semiconductor twist to it. So uh, again, free facilities courtesy of the Irvine Company, which is the largest private developer in the country. And uh, they give us 34,000 square feet of office space, totally free, uh, both at UTC and uh, downtown. Uh, some one-liners on the companies we have. Uh, great companies. Uh, we're real proud of all of these. They went through a, tr a very rigorous process to enter. And uh, so they're all on their website. Uh, as you can see, a lot of fun. I currently also run a cardiology software company. Don't ask me how that happened. But a dear friend of mine founded a company, Dr. Greg Feld, out of a UCSD hospital. And um, uh, the, I joined the board after they graduated from the incubator. 
Just because they graduate and raise capital doesn't mean they're home free. And uh, so I jumped in to be CEO last September, among my other jobs, thoroughly enjoying it. And one of the things I want to leave you with is that this area of healthcare is going to see some dramatic changes with the with the uh, with engineers from other sectors moving into this space. As other sectors mature, like semiconductors, et cetera, et cetera, you're going to see these really bright people who have zero healthcare experience come in and re-energize this space and work with clinicians and the life science group to do things faster than they've ever done before. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. <laughs> last, last we have Sharon. Good morning, everyone. I don't have any slides, so I'll be brief and do an introduction of myself, and we can jump right into the panel. A little bit about my background. I got into healthcare about four years ago when I became president of One Medical Group, which is based in San Francisco and is a boutique primary care model focused on technology-enabled service delivery that is building a national brand. My background prior to joining them was deep in retail. I spent many years with KFC when I was part of PepsiCo and with The Gap. Um, but prior to joining One Medical, I spent seven years with Electronic Arts, so I have a deep gaming background, which has been an interesting um, skill set and experience to, to marry with healthcare. A year ago, I left One Medical Group and created Avic Ventures as a vehicle to immerse myself in health innovation. And I've been working over the last year as an advisor and angel investor in the space. Along the way, I became a mentor with Rock Health and with Astia, um, and also a founding member of Astia Angels. Um, I'm doing some work currently with a new Chicago-based healthcare incubator called Avia, which some of you may have heard about, that is going to be working with large provider organizations to help um, them identify and implement technology-enabled product and services. And my initial focus with them is on patient engagement. Over the last year, I've probably met well over 100 entrepreneurs. I've made four investments, and um, most of my deal flow comes from the, my network, but I also have established some important relationships with some VCs who see a lot of stuff that's maybe too early for them, but want to help them along and help them get some initial funding and some uh, advice, and that's led to some interesting um, board opportunities as well. Thank you. Thanks. Well, so obviously we have a full house of expertise here in various stages of uh, uh, financing and challenges that we encounter in digital health. So I'm going to open up uh, uh, some discussion here that uh, I mentioned earlier, obviously we see a healthy cliffs of uh, increasing fundings and interest from investors. But over and over again, we heard, you know, even in the rooms, people rumbling, it's how difficult it is to go you know, getting an angel round and then how do you graduate that to institutional round to my knowledge, there's a huge gap. So um, I want to le lead that to, to Don. What do you experience from your network? How these companies, are they having difficulty to find institution investors? And what are the challenges? What do you do to help them out? So there's, uh, if kind of looking at both of the, the endpoints there, there's the, uh, there's the getting the funding by uh, an angel group, which is, is one end. And then on the other end, which I think Jack is talking about, is then in terms of funding uh, for that first institutional round. And one of the, the key things in, and is working with angels that are really professional investors and have experience in the industry. Uh, and so, you know, again, like with Health Tech Capital, that we have many uh, venture members that are part of the group. We have uh, angel members that have experience in raising uh, venture uh, capital funds, and so with that, you really know what it takes to shape up a company and to re and what the elements are to really have it be appropriate for venture funding. That said, the another part of where really is a sweet spot for angel investments is to have a company that can get to uh, what we call sustainability without venture capital, so that that gets to some kind of cash flow break even, uh, you know, even possibly to an exit. Uh, it's, really, uh, uh, it's really sweet if you have a company where venture capital is an option, not a life or death need. Uh, and so with that, that also, ironically, makes you more attractive when it comes time to be venture. You know, so there's nothing like raising money if you don't absolutely need it. 
so, so that becomes uh, uh, really quite a good pathway. There are other companies that really are based on an entire venture track. Venture will be, uh, uh, is part of the equation and Angel is just the first step there. And you just need to be able to, uh, to tailor it uh, to, to follow that path. Oh, fantastic, so, certainly Health Tab Capital is doing a lot of work for the, uh, your, uh, your, your company that you're incubating or financing. Um, so, so Kilo, from your perspective, you mentioned earlier, certainly venture debt so certainly is to, as you mentioned, to, uh, to build equity value. So is that, I mean, what do you see the challenges? Obviously, you're sitting way back and you see these companies struggling. What's your take on what do we do and what's the status? I'd like to follow up on Don's or sort of comment on Don's, Don's um, point that if you, if you can build a company without venture capital, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, there's nothing wrong with it. In fact, it may be a good thing. You may still end up taking venture institutional funding or strategic funding to scale later, but it's a, it seems to be a much more viable way to go um, in this space and let's say it would be in drug development where you just can't do that. It costs so much, clinical trials are so expensive, it is, it's a non-starter. So it's an interesting dynamic to watch. But what we see is we see a lot of business plans where we would like to stay in touch and you know, watch the companies as they grow. And we see a lot of issues around companies not being able to scale. They get something cool, you know, it has a high cool value, they have some folks that are starting to buy and then it kind of stops right there. And then we watch this gap and we watch them not get across the gap and can you know smarter people than me can probably answer why that is and how it is but it definitely stands out in this particular space to us and another thing to comment on is we we talked to a lot of ECs that's part of our our job we funded 355 million last year to life science healthcare companies that's all we do that's a lot of deals so that's a lot of ECs we talk to and they they run in different pods you know there's a pod of life science biotech traditional medtech VCs and being from San Diego, being interested in this space, even though as an amateur, I often ask, what do you think of the digital health and medical wireless and you know, all the different health IT, different flavors that you have? And they pretty much fall in two categories. Either it's, we don't understand it, we don't understand the business, we'd rather stick with regular biology, and that's very big dollars that are saying that because they don't understand it. Or else the folks who do understand it and who do like it we don't understand very well because they come more from a tech comfort zone or for healthcare service comfort zone. And that's where we fall ourselves a little bit short in what do we understand? We like the deal, can we really do it? Can we really understand it? What kind of communication do we have with the venture? And I think there's some of that as different folks from different backgrounds and having had success in different backgrounds such as you know tech, telecom, wherever, are converging on healthcare and making that happen so will the more traditional venture folks get more, uh, more comfortable with the space. I mean, we're increasingly seeing it, but not as fast as we thought it was gonna happen a couple of years ago. In fact, Jack, I'd like to throw the question to you. You're a strategic VC, what are you seeing? And are you seeing other strategics come in? And what are you seeing in your conversations with the venture folks about this space? Well, I think uh, digital health is an interesting area, holds a lot of potential. So obviously we've seen a struggling in the farmer side, as you alluded. And uh, one of the issues is uh, very much a binary, right? You, you, you keep on investing, investing, hopefully there's gonna be a breakthrough uh, versus digital health, especially in the area that we had touched on some of those ITs and some application, it's not necessarily a binary, it's an incremental, more traditional to a venture milestone driven, Roy mentioned earlier. So we see two camps of investors uh, coming into this. One is obviously the traditional uh, IT guys, uh, you know, foray into that. Even IT guys are dare enough to touch companies that actually has to go through the FDA, probably the class one, class two devices mainly. Or the other side is we see the biotech guys will certainly look optimistically, how do they making a play, shorter horizon, tax capital efficient. So we're very lucky. I think there is a, a conference of uh, both sides uh, uh, getting into that. Uh, but meanwhile, you know, you, you, could, you could argue the other way. Neither side would want to touch some of the companies, perhaps some of the companies in this room. Yeah, so, so cool. Um, so we talked about these, you know, angels and uh, you know the traditional, even the value-added angels that uh, Don you mentioned. Uh, what about the other things that are going on? I read news about you know crowdfunding. Uh, later on, we're going to hear Sonny Wu that he went through this crowdfunding, and there is others uh, like AngelList, non-traditional, probably a little bit high-touch. 
so what's the perspective there? Roy, do you have any experience on that? You know, is that? No, no experience on crowdfunding in this area. Okay. How about, how about Sharon? Um, well, a couple things. I, I think one of the things I see changing, you know, a year ago there were um, entities like MedStarter, let's say, that was starting yeah. in this space, more traditional crowdfunding. Um, just recently, um, a new entrant called Health Funder. You know, there sure. seems to be getting more and more proliferation of these vehicles. Um, on the non-healthcare specific side, it used to be that Kickstarter was kind of you know, all there was, and then um, you have a company um, called Funders Club that comes out of Y Combinator. And the shift that I'm seeing in that space is um, that the companies seem to be more cur curated or more qualified, that they're going through a more rigorous um, screening to qualify them, um, and there's some sort of vetting and support that comes along rather than just them marketing themselves, um, you know, putting themselves out there um, to the market. Um, I think AngelList is another interesting source uh, for companies. I think it's great for discovery. Um, I've been um, discovered by companies on it. I've used it to discover companies to see who else uh, is investing in things that may be uh, of interest. Um, and I'm kind of encouraged to see where they might take their platform. Yeah. So maybe I can kind of chime yeah, in just a little bit with the, uh, the crowdfunding. Uh, and I, I think there's an important distinction to make with crowdfunding is that all of the platform, most of the platforms that are out there now are non-equity based. They're, they're really uh, uh, a rewards or, or product based. And that can make a lot of sense for companies. And uh, companies do need to understand that there's a full marketing effort that goes behind it in order to be successful raising uh, funds on these platforms. With the new Jobs Act that's coming down that's talking about uh, uh, having crowdfunding for non-accredited investors, uh, that, there's a lot of landmines in there, and so I would, I would just caution people to be really careful with, uh, with that part of it. I, I think that's going to have a lot of issues if, if the rules ever even get written for implementation. Yeah, but do, does create another route to uh, some of the company. In fact, we see an iterative uh, process going on now as the companies are going through uh, incubators, and the incubators perhaps graduate to an uh, institutional led round. Even at that stage, they even go on to crowdfunding to get the first test of their product uptake. Uh, I know. Uh, I think it's great for market testing. That's right. But obviously, at the risk of uh, that you divulge your little bit secret, a little bit too early to the uh, to the outsider. So there's a really a good uh, uh, examples out there how people can use these various stages for the benefits of their company and building their companies. Yeah, so that's definitely fascinating, something to, to watch for. Uh, it's not just for uh, the, 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 the brand new startups, even company in mid stages may think about how do you re-energize the company and development using some of those sources. Crowdfunding is something to watch for. So uh, back to the, uh, the questions on the, uh, the incubators, obviously that sounds tre tre tremendous. I get the free rent, I get the free everything. Um, I was ready to move in. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to San Diego. Um, so, so how you, I mean, there are obviously there's pros and cons and how do you make the best out of it. So Roy, from your perspective as an entrepreneur, what do they, what, what can they expect from the incubator? What, how can they make the best out of it, giving all the luxuries that you afford them? How do they, what are some of the best practices which you, in your experience, what the company works really well, taking advantage of and some of those probably just flopped, a waste of time and, uh, kindness of your, largest of your investors. Well, back to the investor question we have here. Uh, it is very, very difficult to raise capital now. Uh, even for the incubator companies that come in with rock star teams, uh, they still have to work very hard. And maybe five, six, seven years ago, with their good looks and a PowerPoint, they got to raise money. But now it's very difficult. And uh, angel money is, is, is a necessity and these early stage companies, even with teams that have been there, done that before, had outcomes, led public companies, they have to raise angel money. And then they have to put a lot of effort into strategic. We're seeing more and more strategic uh, investors look at these early stage companies as, as venture. Uh, in some ways, they're like, it's like the, you know, the, the ocean and the waves. They move away from certain spaces. We see the strategists getting more involved, like Qualcomm and in others. And uh, so I think that um, going forward, you'll still have venture involved with, uh, with these early stage companies, in particular healthcare, 
but it's more angel and strategic. Uh, the, um, the companies that we've incubated, we've incubated over 40 companies. This is a very new project. We're not like Y Combinator, plug and play with 15 years of experience, and we've never done this before. So uh, there's not a lot of track record here, but so far so good. The, um, the, uh, the companies that enter our incubator, uh, really we address everything that they need, and from fixing their cap sheets, sitting down with them, their leadership, their founders, and, and giving them really tough love. And, and uh, we, although we have no stock, we have no board seats, we have such huge influence on them, we're able to convince founders to step aside and bring in a new CEO. Uh, and um, that, that influence, uh, that realistic approach is what's really valuable. And then I reach into my board of directors when a company is far enough along where I feel, we feel as a, a committee and the, the oversight committee of, at the incubator, they're ready to present to a large strategic. Then we'll set that up. Uh, we don't, we really don't want them presenting when they're way too early. It's just, we know they have one shot. But um, the area of healthcare, we had our largest uh, class of healthcare companies in this last round and a very diverse teams. And the last 15 companies that were admitted, we only had two rookies, rookie teams. The rest of them are coming through with serial entrepreneurs uh, great experience, but they all know raising capital is going to be miserably hard, and they're going to have to reach out, friends and family, widows and orphans, you name it, to raise the money. And most yeah. of it is uh, on notes that convert to Series A. But uh, make no mistake about it, I see this every single day. It's hard to raise money right now. Absolutely. Uh, and obviously, I was going to say on the flip side, obviously, we see you know the mushroom of incubators and sometimes we feel that really they're incubating a feature instead of a company. So Sharon, what, what's your experience? Obviously, you mentioned you're involved with some incubators as well. How do you avoid that pitfall of manufacturing too many companies and create an even bigger problem for the venture community? Yeah, there definitely is a proliferation of incubators. Everybody seems to be using the name incubator, accelerator, various. We should do an incubator of incubator. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, you know, obviously the one that I'm closest to is, is Rock Health uh, in San Francisco. Class five is, is just starting uh, with them. And, they, and they've changed a lot over the last uh, few years. They're getting more rigorous in their screening. There are a lot more serial um, entrepreneurs um, that in part has come from adding uh, partners like Mayo and, and Kaiser and um, venture firms like Aberdare and Moore Davidow and Kleiner. Um, the bar is getting, getting raised. It, it's getting much tougher. And um, I'd say, you know, all these programs are not created equal. For, I think they can be a huge benefit for an entrepreneur to go into, um, but I think it's important to look at what is the, the value add, and the value add is not just the, the capital, which might be about $100,000 uh, that they're providing in exchange for a fairly high percentage of equity. I think 6% is kind of the, the going rate, whether it's a Techstars or a sure. Rock Health. Um, but it's, you know, who are those backers and who are those partners um, that the companies can gain access to, whether it's the VCs or some of the strategics that they'll have a, more of a direct entree into and a chance to establish themselves um, with. Um, but oftentimes I think the value comes mostly from, one, tapping into the mentors and just milking that for all, all it's worth. But the PR and the social proof, particularly at the angel stage and seed stage, a lot of um, Funding is raised because of who's already in the deal. People often don't want to be the first to be in. They're looking for who, who's signed on. And being part of an incubator can provide some of that social proof, I think, in, in credibility, particularly if you're one of, one of the more established ones. And there is a, a, a bit of a hierarchy, and certainly um, ones with better um, you know, geographical um, yeah. penetration. One of the advantages that we had going in, we, uh, ComNexus is one of the leading high-tech associations of San Diego uh, and a board that goes across sectors. And that got well-established, uh, well-supported in the community, and then we started the incubator. Sure. So that, that gave us this, really this great advantage of having the broader community, Qualcomm, LG, Sony, Viasat, the local, executives, and these are operational people that are on the board, have real day jobs, uh, 
it totally involved with our incubator as opposed to having to reach out to those strategics that don't even know what we're doing. So that handoff is very smooth with our incubator companies when the time is right. Yeah, absolutely. Especially, I think the incubators organize them well, especially with a certain domain expertise. Certainly, uh, forming a, a relationship with a, a, a like-minded VCs and, uh, and strategic really helps because at my day job, just to add my color to this, is you know I was telling people my job is like a real estate agent, right? I know the market. I know each house come to the market, and that <laughs> all, the 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 more I see, the better I am. All I do is comparison shopping. So whenever there's a Rock Hills class, I'm eager to see because at the one time I see 16, to, uh, 8 to 10 companies, and it's all about comparison shopping. Hopefully, you know somehow we can convince ourselves out of the 10 we should finance one. So definitely, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's hard, uh, I have to say, in digital health, um, unlike in social, uh, uh, social uh, uh, digital media, and you know, obviously, just kind of uh, talk about a little bit on, on our side, you know, we just had an exit, a company called Waze, that Google bought for $1.15 billion. Consider that company has no revenue, and yet they unleashed $1.15 billion cash into Israel. They were talking about there may be an impact to the to the, to the fiscal in, uh, in Israel. But what that means is that the $1.1 billion end up in some very entrepreneurial, spirit, spirited people, right? Some of the angel investors. So they'll definitely reinvest. So what I'm hoping is, with all the helps here, that we'll create our ways in digital health or our Instagram, and hopefully we can unleash some of those capital and get recycled and get the, uh, the things more accelerated. So that's certainly uh, one of my wish list. Um, so kind of moving along, yeah, Don, you have. I, I just interject one quick comment here with uh, you know, incubators, accelerators, angel groups, is you really want to look for a good fit. Uh, if, uh, you know, if you have a, a group that's focused on, say, the, uh, the consumer side of things, and you have an in-hospital workflow app, that, that may not be the best fit. You may, you may really want to be looking for another group and looking at uh, you know, if there is 6% of the equity coming up. And, and just a real quick example of there was one company that was on, uh, came into AngelList, uh, was, had, didn't get any interest whatsoever. Uh, and, but then uh, when they came into Health Tech Capital, we had the domain expertise to really understand what it was that they were doing. And so, and we're really happy to lead term sheets. So we led a term sheet and uh, uh, through a syndication, they ended up clo closing an oversubscribed $1.1 million round. So, it, uh, so you really want to look at, at the fit with the investors and the groups of, of what it is with what you're doing. Yeah, that's fantastic. Certainly these conferences will help to uh, connect to people and also spread the words. Um, so move on a little bit, and obviously companies succeeded and they get some uh, institutional financing. And Kilo, you mentioned about this debt to build equity. I really take that note here. That uh, So what do you think, what's a good time uh, for a company to get the maximum, va maximum value and timing to get uh, venture debts? And let's say just, I just closed $10 million. Should I wait for six months or should I go right away knock on your door? What are the pros and cons? And that's, a, that's a great question. I, I'd say the good time to, it depends on where that 10 million takes you. What's the timing of it? You might want to calculate where are you going to run out of money, and you don't want to go and ask for venture debt when you're about to run out of money because you're just not going to get it. On the other hand, if it takes you for three years, you probably don't want to do that either because you'll be paying us and you really don't get anything for it. So look at how much you raise. If you raise 12 to 18 months worth of capital, you can probably do that after the equity raise. Sometimes you can do it together with the equity raise. Oftentimes, especially in the current times where you know, it's sometimes difficult to get rounds together. You have, you're setting out to get a certain amount. Um, we're happy to go in if equity goes in. It's just our condition. We can top off the round, so that's done at the same time. But I'd say the the best time is not too late, but also not so early that you're not going to use the money. And so that really depends on where the money takes you to, what's the milestone, and what can you show that you're getting for the debt. And, and so specifically, when somebody comes to me, because not everybody has the same philosophy around debt. We like, and we're very well aligned with the companies and the management teams, we're, you know, we're debt investors, so we think that way, but we're very much looking at what do you get for that. Some folks come and say, well, I got some equity, I should get some debt, because it's extra capital. That's great, but 
I'm going to have to ask you, what's that extra capital getting you? You know, what, what are you, I'm not going to say no. I'm going to say, what are you going to build with it? And let's figure out what's the right amount. Let's figure out what's the right structure. And then let's see what value it gets you and what value it gets us. Because otherwise, if it gets you no value, it's extra capital. But by the way, at the end of the day, you still owe us that money. And you've now spent the money and you've built no value from it. You're just worse off than you were before. You don't want to do that. Sometimes that happens just because in real life, not everything works out. That's okay. That's our business to say no when we think you're too early or, or you know, too small or too risky for debt. Because last thing that a debt provider wants to do is over lever the company. That's, you know, I don't want you to give me your keys because I don't want to be operating your company. Ideally, you'll go and do a great job and build it value. And then another way to answer that question is also what's the, what's the general stage? If you're looking to commercialize, for example, you already have the product and you're launching or you're even in a little bit of revenue, that's a very easy use of that because you can then just sort of accelerate and amplify that. And um, venture debt is uh, something that you can get, commercial debt probably not yet. And uh, another venue where any time is a good time, particularly if you're looking to build equity value using debt, is when you look to license or acquire something in. Because then right as you sign the check, you will have created additional value by bringing in these assets. So That's certainly something to consider, that the financial engineering can really benefit the company if you do the right moves or right calculation. And uh, certainly, uh, there's lots of uh, vehicles out there. Uh, so um, I have another thing that we want to talk about is you know some of the practice happening in actually in the early stage financing more or less. Uh, you know, especially in the Series A, there's lots of debates about whether it should take a convertible note format or should they do a price around. I, I'm sure each of you have some uh, some opinion on it. So, so down, what would you typically did you do? Do you do a convertible notes or do you have a preference to do a price around? So we ha we have a strong preference for uh, for price rounds, and I, I think it, it's useful to look at where convertible notes originally uh, or originated and. So they really were used and, and came about for, uh, to do bridge loans. So if you were a, an angel investor and there was uh, perhaps a, a VC round that was in due diligence, uh, the company needed a little bit of runway, uh, you know, kind of what venture debt is at a later round, is that uh, uh, you would put the money into the company and expecting the round to close in the next three or four months. And of course, there's some risk to that so that you would get uh, say a 20% uh, premium uh, converting into that round because you took that bit of an extra risk and you came in earlier. There's a very big trend now where uh, of using convertible notes to do entire funding rounds. And from an investor standpoint, from a, a disciplined professor, uh, professional investor standpoint, that, that really uh, creates a lot of difficulties. Uh, for one thing, you know, your money is going in now uh, and I would certainly expect that 18 months from now uh, that you're going to make a substantial improvement in the valuation of your company if you're doing a good job. Uh, it really should probably be double or, or more of what it is today, yet it's going to be a 20% discount to some price that's totally unknown in the future. Uh, so that, that makes a, a more difficult investment proposition. But probably even more important is that in doing a price round, and you're really, from our standpoint, again, it comes back to that mentoring and really getting involved and being partners with the company. Because uh, your investors really should be partners. If all they are are dollars, uh, you're really not getting your value out of your investors. And so with getting in and really doing a price round, an equity round, that's where we're really getting in, in lockstep into the harness with you to really build that company and one of the key issues that scares off a lot of people is that negotiation of valuation. And a point that I really like to make is that, look, if we can't sit down and come to a meeting of the minds of the valuation right up front here, if, if, if we're that far apart, if we can't work together on that, then that's really a bad sign for having this ongoing relationship. And probably, you know, both of us should really think about whether we're the right partners for each other. So that's kind of a, a first uh, initial test of the relationship. That's, that's very good. So certainly you have a firm position. How about the other panelists? Do you have any inputs no, one way or the I've, other? I've invested in, in both. Um, typically, it, it's kind of hard. There is, there is a proliferation of um, convertible notes uh, being used for longer periods of time and to do full financings. Um, 
I think you know, some of these er earlier companies, it's often harder if they don't have a partner like a health tech capital or somebody uh, to have somebody lead uh, in setting what the value is because it's a very fragmented uh, I investor base. I would and agree, you don't want unprofessional people setting your valuation. Right. Um, and, and if the entrepreneur is setting it, that can uh, also be uh, some, somewhat concerning. Um, often, many of them are so early that they don't have a lot yet to hang your hat on from a valuation perspective um, either. So it tends to go hand in hand with where they are in, um, on the spectrum of, of um, maturity, if, if you will, as well. But uh, all things being equal, I would prefer to be investing um, equity unless it is more of a bridge situation because the 20% discount that's typical typically isn't enough of a reward yeah. um, for what could be 12, 18 months or, or more um, of having your money tied up. Uh, so there's certainly and you can get crammed down. I, I had this happen yeah. to me once where uh, the institutional uh, investor, a venture capital firm, ca came in and um, they got a couple of the larger investors on side and they completely negated the terms of oh, yeah. the convertible uh, yeah. note the, and then the, the price was different. Obviously so that they, they, they can so do it ended up being like a 12% discount yeah. instead. Well, they can do uh, even do a price round as well, right? Yeah. So there's no, no, no way to mitigate yeah, that if you, you fail you to. Have, you generally have more leverage when you yeah. actually own the stock. So it's, yeah, there's the voting rights, yeah, essentially. Uh, that, that's cool. So, uh, you know, given the time we have, I want to leave a little time for the Q&As, but before I jump into that, I thought, you know, each of us obviously work in this industry for a long time and we obviously close door here. So if any of you can give from what you think at the stage where we are, what are the best advice you can give? Maybe share a little secret. What are the things on your top of mind that if you were entrepreneur, here's the advice, here's what I do. So sort of in that. So, so I would say in the companies that, coming, that come in to us uh, and uh, to play off uh, an earlier comment, we, we don't fund PowerPoints either. We fund real companies with real teams. And the companies that really have proof points on their business model, uh, really understand who their customer is and have some sort of a, uh, a proof that the quote, the dog is going to eat the dog food and pay for the dog food. Uh, so there's some evidence that, there's, uh, uh, that the payment model is going to work that really causes companies to stand out and, uh, uh, and to stand above what the rest of the crowd is. That's it. I'm happy to go. Um, I'd say, you know, um, Rory touched on this a bit of, you know, they don't necessarily take companies out to meet with strategics or, you know, institutional investors until they're ready um, and then be very thoughtful about when that timing is and what the approach is. Um, I too often see companies that are just wasting those bullets um, because they aren't doing their homework about knowing who they're pitching to and whether the fit is right. They aren't prioritizing who they're talking to. And everybody talks. Um, so I think I'd encourage people to be more judicious and um, thoughtful and more prepared and to tailor your pitch to, to the audience. Um, a, a bit more. Um, if I get one more um, email that says, Dear Sir, <laughs> um, it's a dead giveaway that somebody didn't even bother to read my website where I spell it out very clearly what I'm interested in and what I'm not. So um, I'm shocked always at the number of people. How can you take them seriously if they won't yeah. take themselves seriously in their preparation? So do the homework, don't waste your bullets. And uh, I, I have to agree with you, you know, obviously. A warm introduction is very good, but you know you, you got to be sensitive. And how do you position so that? Sometimes I find it's probably better to take me out for lunch. Is what well, I'm not suggesting. That. I'm saying to an informal meeting instead of coming to the office for a pitch. Because if you're not ready, if you position that, you just waste a, a milestone, so to speak. Roy, you know, if I could really give some advice on raising capital, and uh, I raised a lot of money. In the last 10 ventures I've done, and six of them have cratered and lost all the investors' money, and four of them somehow made it. And in baseball, those are Hall of Fame numbers. Uh, but uh, you, you really, it, it's nice to be able to have every angel investor understand the domain, but it's not a necessity at all. You need a few of the angels that, that are in the round to understand what the heck you're doing, and it's really important that the other angels look to them as due diligence. But at the end of the day, it's they're high net worth, qualified investors, and their money spends like anybody else's money. And uh, the, the, the success of, a, of an angel round really depends on a few lead angels, like uh, the success of a venture round, a few lead investors. 
But if you've got a domain area, whether it's semiconductors, healthcare, whatever, and you've got some angel investors that know the space cold, incredible, other angels are gonna follow. They are going to follow. You cannot complete a round with everybody being a partner and understanding what you're doing. It's just absolutely impossible. And as far as bridges go, I agree with them. The bridge has to be, uh, you know, it could be a year maybe at the most. It doesn't mean it's gonna be two years. We're seeing a lot of bridges at the incubator. And uh, that's an advantage uh, because at that point, many in the early stages, they don't have a clue what the valuation is. And if they get angels in that establish a valuation, then it leads to disaster down the road. But uh, again, angel money is absolutely necessity and the key to raising angel money is to get, some, get a few domain people that know what they're doing and other angels will follow. Yeah, fantastic. Kiru? Take the money when you can, but be disciplined about what you do with it. It never hurt anyone to have extra money, but have discipline, and it hurts a lot of people to run out of money or you know, leave money behind when they could have had it and then run out of money. That's right. As a founder, as CEO at the risk, you could lose your job. You lose your own company because you raised the money and you didn't, sm you didn't spend smartly. So uh, we do running tight on time, but I, I was hoping that we can take some uh, quick questions from the audience. So if anybody have any questions for any of me in the back, somebody. Okay. Go ahead. Hi, great, great panel. Thank you so much. I have a question about the scalability and sort of uh, we talk, we hear a lot about emerging growth and managing emerging growth, rapid growth, and you, you see that with waves and other, other industries. How do we get over the scalability issue with the funding and what are key learnings with regard to that and be able to get through that emergent high growth phase? So, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and grab it here. So, you know, I, you, a big part of what that scalability is really having uh, the understanding of the market and the market expertise and, and, you know, frankly, some experience in the particular markets that you're going into. And I'm talking now uh, less about the consumer end of the spectrum, but more where it's uh, selling into a, a hospital or maybe selling into to rehab or assisted living or chronic disease management. I mean, though, you know, there have been products that have been sold into that space. And so that really uh, bringing expertise on board of, of people that have called on those customers, knowing who your customer is and people that have called on those customers and bringing that expertise into your company is, is really crucial and, and can make all the difference in the world to, to get over that hump. Uh, and then once you're out there and you're getting known and you got that traction going, then things success builds on success. Yeah, it, I'm gonna add to that. It, it, it takes that no fear entrepreneur to start the company that bets the farm, and that person may not be the one that can scale it, quite honestly, but it's the right person to get it started, and then that person needs to step aside and, and someone needs to come in that can actually knows how to scale it because making one chip versus millions a day Big difference. And stepping aside doesn't necessarily mean leaving the company. I mean, there's Correct. often very important roles, leadership roles within the company for that entrepreneur. Well, I, I guess I was just going to add some of my own color here. The, uh, the scalability, it's actually much to do as a design of your company, right? So uh, most recently I had a, a talk with my, one of my portfolio company. I was telling him that how well some of the trackers, Fitbit and Jawbones they're doing and scaling, obviously. <laughs> And, uh, and he was sh shook his head, he goes, am I missing something, right? So, so it's, it's all relative, so you know, it's certainly great to build a company that can scale to billions, but there, also, there is utility, there is success to company to scale to millions of people at need, especially where we are dealing with chronic disease, et cetera. So it's just how you design the company, define that scale. So Joe, should I take in one more question or should we? Take another question, we'll take that. Okay, one last chance, go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you again my, uh, for, for your time. Um, in terms of the incubator, you mentioned that there are some companies that you drop. I wanted to know what do you have to do to get dropped? 
Well, <laughs> let's talk about scalability. Uh, when we started our downtown incubator, uh, which is all software startups, uh, you have no idea whether two guys and a dog are gonna be the next Craigslist. Not a clue. Uh, and they're first time entrepreneurs. So if you look at some of those early stage web 2.0 software apps deals, you don't have a clue. So you really have to, you know, you admit them in, they have a neat idea. And in about six months, you figure out, well, they're not gonna scale beyond two guys and the dog. At that point in time, it becomes more of a lifestyle business. Uh, we have only limited resources, so they leave the incubator and that doesn't mean they're gonna fail. I mean, they just, they just keep going. Maybe they'll be profitable, but they will not scale into a business that'll move the needle in San Diego. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks for the, uh, the panelists and thanks for the audience. Thanks.